Fox, and I'm a senior managing director of Guggenheim Eye Media, where I look after our media assets primarily in you know, music and television space. Dennis Leonard, um, Wiz, met the Grateful Dead at Woodstock, joined them in 1971, stayed with them through 1987, where he joined Lucasfilm, and he's worked on such films as Polar Express and Despicable Me and many of the Harry Potter series. And Next to me is uh, Mr. Bob Weir, founding member of the Grateful Dead. Hi, kids. Hi, hi. <laughs> Chief troublemaker and uh, founder and owner of TRI Studios, a state-of-the-art recording studio for artists Definitely a in San Rafael. <laughs> Definitely a troublemaker. So uh, I thought maybe I'm really not going to moderate. I'm just going to help kind of keep us on course because we don't have a, a lot of time for a, a topic that we could spend quite a bit of time talking about. But I thought maybe it'd be interesting, Bobby, if we started talking a little bit about um, the Grateful Dead and you know, you as a band and you as a founding band member, um, the Grateful Dead really were at the forefront of delivering a high quality live experience first at a time where that really didn't exist. And I thought maybe you could talk a little bit about how that progressed from the 60s through the wall of sound sure. through uh, maybe the late 70s to 80s. <coughs> Well, we started out playing clubs, and that was a pretty lo-fi experience. Uh, the sound systems in clubs were horrendous. And we had, you know, traditional standard back line back then. And we played most of the year in, in those conditions. And toward the end of that year, we got hooked up with a, a bunch of crazies in a, in a, in a little, little explosion called the acid test. And at the acid test, we met this guy, Alice Stanley. Now, Alice Stanley was a brilliant guy. Uh, he was a chemist and a scientist engineer. And he, among other things, he brought us to an awareness of uh, sound quality, audio sound quality. Uh, we worked with him for a number of years, and that led to the formation of Alembic Sound, which was our first attempt at, uh, at a really quality sound, what they call sound reinforcement system, a public address system, PA. And uh, we used that for a few years, uh, you know, through the Europe 72 tours and all that kind of stuff. And that sort of mushroomed into what we called, what was called the wall of sound. And, you know, you've probably, we don't have a picture of it here, but we, you've probably seen pictures of it. It was what I used to call the monster with a thousand screaming eyes. <laughs> and it was, uh, it was behemoth, impractical, and probably the best PA system ever devised by the hands of man, or assembled. Um, <laughs> But its impractic impracticability uh, uh, shut us down for a year. It was just we were losing money just using it. So we had to shut down and, and uh, pretty much start over. And that was in 19, late 74, so we shut down for 75. And in 76, we went back on the road and used just what was available, the standard uh, sound reinforcement systems. Then in, uh, that went on for a couple of years, and then in 79 or 80, I think it was, uh, was at the a a AEC, the Audio Engineers uh, Convention, or AES, excuse me, AES Convention, the Audio Engineers Society Convention, and I met a guy named uh, John Meyer, and he was a brilliant physicist uh, and a scientist, and, and he developed a lot of, we, we started working with him, and he developed, uh, we developed together a uh, state-of-the-art sound system, which basically revolutionized uh, PAs again. And we worked with him pretty much through the end of uh, the Grateful Dead's days. Now, in essence, we were always intent on presenting the best quality sound possible, the way we wanted to hear it ourselves. At, at that, I'm going to hand it off to Wiz. 
Okay, uh, yeah, the Grateful Dead gave me my first uh, pro job in audio, and uh, like Bobby says, uh, they were always into pioneering. And one of the things that was really fun for techno nerds was uh, even if we had just made something or procured something, if it was discovered that there was something better, we were going to get it. You know, yeah, there was, yeah, there was yeah. no question about it. If it's better, we have to do it. So the aim of our little part of this talk is to talk about where audio is right now and where it can possibly go. So I'm going to give you an insight into the nuts and bolts of digital audio. Uh, how many people have ever listened to um, vinyl, vintage vinyl? OK, so you know. Um, it can be a pain, but the way that it ends up as uh, digital sound is that it's sliced together. There are pictures taken. Can you put up the first slide? So what you see at the top is a sine wave. It's nice and round, organic looking. And it's analog. It's analog. That's the way it looks like if you look at it with an oscilloscope, for instance. And the one underneath it, it's sliced into bits, and they're like little stair steps. And then the one down below that, the stair steps are a little larger, uh, lower resolution. Now put the next one up. So we descend in resolution till we end up with that bottom one, which has uh, six stair steps for that sine wave. And believe it or not, but when you listen to really high frequencies, the bottom is a represent representation of how those frequencies are recorded digitally. And the way it works so you don't hear buzzing or a hum instead of uh, something smooth like a bell is the electronics actually do an average between those stair steps. And the higher the frequency, the less pictures are taken. So those electronics must work overtime. And what happens to us when we listen to that is we are also interpolating because we're not getting all of the information. The top sine wave is organic. We're built to listen to organic sound. We hear slightly different t terminology uh, in the reference to digital sound. You might hear something like a CD, for instance, is 44,100 of those pictures per second, and it's 16 bits which means that 44,000 pictures are taken a second, and each of those pictures uses 16 bits to give you what the dynamic of that particular picture is like. And more is better in both cases. You might ask yourself, well, if it's compromised and that's not the greatest, why hasn't it changed? That's what we're asking as well. Uh, one of the things that we found just looking at the market right now is that storage is ridiculously cheap, processes are incredibly fast, and in fact, in 1980, this is fact, at the same time that the CD standard was established, IBM introduced the first one gigabyte hard drive. One gigabyte hard drive was the size of a refrigerator and weighed 550 pounds. It cost $40,000, $40,000. So if you could have put a terabyte drive back together back then, it would have been 1,000 refrigerators of floor space and weighed 50,000 pounds and cost millions and millions of dollars. Fast forward to today, you can go to Best Buy down the block and walk out with a one terabyte drive for about 75 bucks and stick it in your shirt pocket. Indicative of the fact that technology has changed exponentially, and we aren't, for the most part, the general public isn't even listening to CD quality anymore. Because, because of the issues of bandwidth, storage on uh, personal players, or in your phone or iPod, people have decided on MP3, AAC, FLAC, and a number of other uh, standards because they're very tricky. They're taking this digital signal and using smoke and mirrors to compress it even further. And as you do that, what happens is information disappears. 
It's why we like vinyl, because with the scratch pops and hiss and whatever noises that are there, all the information is there. And the interesting thing is, physiologically, we can filter out noise. You get used to it. You even, you know, if you listen to a record and you listen to it a lot, if there's a pop in the third verse, you're kind of ready for it. So what we have is a medium that has not only not advanced the CD standards, the same CD standard it was in 1980, but we've accepted a standard which is compromised to that. Uh, all the info is there in vinyl. It's just not in digital right now. The interesting thing is that um, professional audio has chosen, for the most part, 96 kilohertz, 96,000 pictures per second with 24 bits as a standard for recording. And people recognize that. If people listen to 96K, they go, wow, I can't tell why, but it sounds better. And the reason that it's kind of ambiguous as to why is because these are deep physiological and psychological things. Some of them are based on our survival mechanism. We are built to learn location of sound because it's a survival mechanism. And all that information is incredibly low level. And the digital medium doesn't record that now. The interesting thing is, uh, and I just looked this up the other night, at 96K, 24-bit, a 32 gigabyte SD card, like probably is in these cameras right here, cost about 20 bucks and would hold a library of close to 16 hours of music. We just need something to plug it into. At 96K. At 96K where basically people do not complain. We can go beyond that, but for now, if we could get music to 96K, if we could minutes. get the bandwidth everywhere so that people weren't frustrated by downloading speeds at uh, that much information, which is many, many, many times more information to download than an MP3 or an AAC, then uh, people would understand that we have a generation of kids out there that have only listened to MP3. And because it's a marketing thing, because it has the digital word attached to it, they think it's the greatest thing since sliced bread. And they don't know any different. <laughs> so Bobby will now give us more of uh, an artistic insight. And the last thing I gotta say is, would you rather listen to a reasonable facsimile of what the artist intended or what the artist actually intended you to hear. Now what I'm gonna do, I, I'm gonna, at some point, at, at one point in this next part, I'm gonna trade off with you, but uh, I'm gonna start out by saying when I was a kid, you know, 16, 17, on a Friday night, we thought it was a great idea to go to somebody's house and put on a couple of records and listen all the way through and just sink into the records, sink into the music. You know, maybe snuggle up with your squeeze and, uh, and just really enjoy the music. You can't do that anymore. It can't happen and I'll tell you why. Um, as, uh, as you saw in the picture, a sine wave, um, it's smooth. It enters your ears, and without resistance, it goes into your brain, because your brain readily recognizes it and uh, assimilates it, and that's that. And uh, you feel it. When you're listening to digital music, that, that series of postcards, your brain has to struggle mightily to, uh, to assemble and make sense out of those postcards. And that's work. And your brain doesn't want to work any more than it has to. So, it, you know, so you're working, you're not enjoying it, it's raising your stress level. Um, I'm gonna show you, uh, if, you, if we can run these, I'm gonna show you a couple of, uh, a picture's worth a thousand words here. And so we're gonna show you a, a a couple of clips of me in, in TRI studio. One is gonna be low res, and it's gonna have low res audio, audio, and then 
one is gonna be higher res audio and higher res uh, video as well. Uh, the, the, uh, the first one is gonna be low res video. Oh, you wanna do the low res first? Uh, no, no, let's do the high, high, res. high res first, yeah. So. Westerly fade away. Last week. <laughs> now the next one. We're still a fade away. We're still a fade away. Anybody notice anything? <laughs> now, in extreme cases, and that was a fairly extreme case, but uh, you guys were able to hear the difference in the audio, but it won't be, it won't be as apparent in, uh, over the web. We're working on that. Um, it, you know, the low res affronts, affronts your system. You know, you will find that if, if you, we could run it again, but we won't. Next time you hear a low res or a see a, ro a low res uh, uh, YouTube, for instance, check your body. Check your body. You'll find that you you become a little tense because it's clinically proven that it raises your stress level, to the low res re low resolution. What we need is to get to much higher resolution in our digital audio and video, well, the video is pretty much there these days. I, mean, but I, think, the, I think, Bobby, that, that, what that video shows, as you said, a picture tells a thousand words, is you know, we, we think all, often that we have five senses, and we talked about this earlier, right. and you can visualize something very easy, and you can very clearly see the difference in the quality there, and if you think about your sense of touch, if you felt a piece of rough sandpaper or a piece of coarse sand, sandpaper, uh, a lighter sandpaper, you would know immediately, and smell and taste is the same thing. And what I think people don't focus on is your brain processes hearing very much in the same way. And, uh, and, and Bobby is really now at the forefront of, of trying to um, bring awareness to that with some other artists and uh, trying to, um, to solve for it in lots of different ways. Uh, yeah. Now, the technology exists today and has for a while to change this. Which le leads us to the next question, which I was going to toss back to you. The, uh, why does the music industry's inertia in moving audio standards forward exist? The consumer, the consumer wants better audio. Artists want to be heard. They want what they're, what they're putting out to be heard. And, uh, and as, uh, as, as Craig will explain to you, there's also ample uh, motivation for the, for the music industry to provide that for them. You know, to, to, to Bob's point, the consumers really have spoken, and there's some data points you can look to re real quickly. Um, in the last year, vinyl sales were up 40% when every other form of music sales was down in double digits. Now, the numbers may be smaller in vinyl, but it's a very interesting thing to look at. Um, Neil Young with his new device, Pono, which Bob may speak about for a moment, which is a device to listen to better quality audio, just raised a record amount of money with a Kickstarter campaign after having, from consumers, selling device after having a hard time getting guys like us to invest in the product. Um, and uh, Apple obviously just paid $3 billion for Beats, primarily a headphone maker which markets itself as making a higher quality and sells a more expensive line of headphones. So clearly designed to move sound quality forward. Um, you then have a situation where, as Bob talked about, obviously the artists are behind it, and that's clear, and you've got Bob sitting here telling you, of course, what artists wouldn't want you to hear what they've made in the studio. So you've got the consumers supporting it. You've got, of course, artists supporting it. And so what are the economic drivers in the industry? Well, you saw with, um, 
From vinyl to cassettes, what happened? Everybody rebought their catalog. From to cassettes to CDs, well, we all rebought our catalogs again. And now you've got an opportunity from the commercial perspective for the people that control the catalogs of music to sell it all over again. So I think our collective perspective is that there is a natural progression towards better quality. It's just intuitively where the industry should go and economically the right decision to make. We live in an environment now where you can listen to 30 million songs on your phone. Um, it may not sound great, but it may sound good enough. People may think it sounds good enough for most consumers. Where's the natural extension of that? How do you differentiate in technology? It seems to us the very easy way to differentiate in technology is to simply make it sound better. And the tech exists. Um, so where do we take this? Well, let me, let me uh, first off, not only in recorded music, but in streaming music, the technology also exists to make, to make the music sound better. Um, so where, are we, where do we go with all this? We know it's happening, but yet it's not happening. Um, I'm working with a number of friends and associates, and I think we're gonna put together what uh, we're calling Musicians for Audio Quality Initiative. It's going to be a, a compendium of, uh, of artists of all stripe and uh, big names and small ones. I'm working with some big names now. Um, and scientists and engineers and industry people. And we're going to try to forward this. We're going to, uh, it's still in formulation and there will be more coming on this subject uh, soon. You know, I would think by next year we'll have it formulated to the point where we can start a grassroots organization that will uh, it'll be mounted on the uh, on the on the internet. I think I, I think we're going to work through uh, an outfit I work, an outfit I work with called Headcount. Um, they're a, an outfit that's sort of working in the same area as Rock the Vote, and uh, I think it's a good fit for an outfit like that. Because we have a lot of artists in, in, involved in headcount and, uh, and, and they, they register voters in uh, concert venues and stuff like that. So it's, you know, people who come to hear music and so this is a good fit for, for Musicians for Audio Quality or Mackie. Um, I'm gonna, I'm gonna wrap my remarks up by saying when I was a kid, music mattered. Music was easy to listen to, it, it hit us much easier. It went straight into our heads, straight into our hearts. And music was very important to everyone in, in our society and our culture back then. It's not as important these days. And I want to bring it back to its cultural, I want to bring music back to its cultural prominence. Uh, I think this Mackey initiative, I think this technology that, ex that exists will help. Um, we, we stand at the threshold of a new era where audio quality can exceed anything that's previously existed. Let's go for it. Let's make music matter again.